All right, hello and thank you for joining us. My name is Elizabeth Angel. I'm the Communications and Program Manager at the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute. And I want to take a minute to welcome you today before we introduce our speakers. Um, if you're not familiar with ERI, we're the leading nonprofit membership organization connecting professionals from a wide range of disciplines all around the world who are dedicated to advancing earthquake resilience. And this webinar is part of our flagship Learning from Earthquakes program, which celebrates its 50th anniversary this year. It was founded in 1973 um, to promote and conduct earthquake reconnaissance around the world and uh, help develop earthquake risk reduction based on the lessons we learned from those earthquakes, in including the devastating one that happened recently in Turkey and Syria. Uh, LFE's work is made possible by the support of ERI members and contributions to the LFE Endowment Fund, uh, and that's also what makes it possible for us to do events like this webinar. And I also wanted to just let you know briefly that ERI's annual meeting is coming up in San Francisco this April. This year we'll be focusing specifically on earthquake reconnaissance as part of that LFE anniversary. So in addition to a technical program, many excellent plenary sessions and lectures, we'll be offering uh, earthquake reconnaissance workshop and exercise designed to give you hands-on training um, and skills in this field. So you can see the URL there if you want to learn more and join. So let me turn today to introducing today's wonderful list of speakers. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Cynthia Pridmore, who is a senior engineering geologist with the California Geological Survey and is the Geological Survey's chair of the California Earthquake Clearinghouse. And that's what she'll be speaking about today. Um, thank you all uh, for uh, coming today. Um, as Elizabeth mentioned, I'm a senior engineering geologist at the California Geological Survey uh, and CGS's representative uh, as the chair of the Earthquake Clearinghouse. My talk today is just a really brief overview of the Clearinghouse if you're not familiar with it or if you're new to it. But after a major and or damaging earthquake in California, the California Geological Survey is authorized to establish a clearinghouse in coordination with its managing partners, uh, Earthquake Engineering Research Institute, which also serves as the vice chair, the US Geological Survey, the California Office of Emergency Services and the California Seismic Safety Commission. Um, so what is a posters great clearinghouse? So basically it's a physical and or virtual location close to the event where scientists and engineers uh, and other professionals can become part of a larger temporary organization whose primary purpose is to collect and disseminate perishable and other critical data. Uh, the Clearinghouse provides the opportunity for all agencies and researchers in the field to coordinate reconnaissance efforts, manage access to restricted areas, request overflights, share findings, and plan and update field teams. Um, who participates? Uh, basically, geologists, structural engineers, geotechnical engineers, geophysicists, private consultants, economists, social scientists, researchers, students. So pretty much anyone who has an interest in collecting data uh, uh, following an event. Uh, expertise spans many disciplines, the geosciences, geotechnical, engineering, structural engineering, non-structural components, insurance, lifelines, transportation, utilities, risk analysis, business continuity, social science. Um, it's a wide array of, of, of interest in researchers that participate. And participating with the clearinghouse is voluntary. It's not like anybody is expected to, to, to show up and have to do something. The clearinghouse briefings um, provide a forum for field teams to report out their findings. This includes both in-person and call-ins from other remotely located personnel, field personnel, and other invited agencies and representatives from the Governor's Office of Emergency Services in Sacramento. The clearinghouse is not emergency response, but it does make information available for regional, state, and federal levels so that uh, field reports and data can inform uh, emergency response and recovery efforts. Uh, within the NIMS and the National Incident Management System, the clearinghouse provides information and situational intelligence to the planning section or branch of the state EOC. Uh, during the Ridgecrest uh, earthquake sequence, and subsequent events, uh, uh, those events that we've, with the Ferndale one as well, uh, we've it's been we've had a pro, uh, an opportunity to test and refine methods for rapidly collecting and disseminating field observations after a large and complex surface rupturing earthquake. Uh, the suite of GIS and other digital tools that are made available 
uh, to rapidly collect and compile field data, leading to the timely synthesis of data for situational awareness of maps, images, media, uh, uh, images for media, areas of interest for LIDAR collection, assisting field teams. Um, all of this is uh, able to uh, be shared very quickly. Um, a very important part of the earthquake clearinghouse, as Elizabeth mentioned, is the learning from earthquakes.org website. Uh, we had a event page for Ridgecrest and we have an event page for, Fern, uh, for the Ferndale event. Uh, this allows opportunity in real time to uh, post uh, uh, notes from the evening briefing. So you can find out if you didn't catch an evening briefing, you can get caught up with what was was uh, 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 took place during it, uh, uh, preliminary reports of all kinds, um, the USGS event pages. Um, any information pertaining to this event uh, can be uh, posted uh, to the Learning from Earthquakes resources page for, for, the, for any event that you're looking at. skip through that and then so you might be asking if you haven't participated before how do you participate in the clearinghouse how do you get involved so when the clearinghouse has established and activated a physical and or virtual location information will be posted on the california earthquake clearinghouse website which is california eq clearinghouse.org um, if you want to receive a direct uh, 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 notification of activation on the web page uh landing web page you can uh Go ahead and advance, join the mailing list. So that was my quick summary of what the Clearinghouse is about. Um, thank you guys for, for joining and um, looking forward to the rest of the presentations about Ferndale. Thanks. Hey, thank you so much, Cindy. Our next speaker, oh, you can just unshare, yeah. Our next speaker is Jay Patton. Uh, he's an engineering geologist for the California Geological Survey. He works in the Seismic Hazards Program and focuses primarily on earthquake and tsunami hazards projects. Thank you. Thank you for having me here to present an overview of the tectonic background of the earthquake and the results from our review of field evidence for the M6.4 Ferndale earthquake sequence. And the people listed here on this slide were essential players in this process to document fragile and perishable geologic fe features left behind by the earthquake. Uh, the process that uh, Cindy mentioned in the last presentation. We used the CGS USGS jointly developed post earthquake digital observation schema to gather field observations in the field. And this time we enlisted a desktop survey of social media posts as input to the database. Uh, here I remind us that the Cascadia subduction zone is a convergent plate boundary where these oceanic plates subduct, where the earthquake cycle causes vertical land motion changes, and where the megathrust earthquakes cause tsunami. Today, we will focus on the Gorda Plate where the M6.4 Ferndale earthquake happened. The Gorda Plate here in the middle of the map forms at the Gorda Ridge on the left with the orange arrows coming out of it, an oceanic spreading center where normal faults form parallel to the ridge. In Southern Gorda in the Mendocino deformation zone, also known as the Triangle of Doom, as the plate is shortened from compression north to south, these faults rotate in a clockwise fashion and are reactivated as left lateral strike slip faults as evidenced by the mechanisms from these er historic earthquakes in the Gorda Plate. Here's a brief view of the surface geology in the region using CDMG and Bob McLaughlin's geologic mapping. And uh, I'd like to point out three things on this map. Uh, first of all, the Neogene to Quaternary, basically three million years ago and younger, Eel River sedimentary basin rocks are folded downwards in the syncline. And on the map, those are the brown colored rocks. And you could see a seismic profile here, how those brown colored rocks are, are down warped in a syncline. And then two, the latest quaternary to modern Eel River fluvial system is inset within these older sedimentary basin rocks. So here's the Eel River system in the middle of the, uh, the brown rocks. And the M6.4 seismicity trend shown by those orange circles, you can see that that trend runs oblique to the surface geology. 
Here are the earthquake mechanisms from most of the earthquakes in this sequence. These beach balls uh, show mostly left lateral, strike slip, and normal or extensional earthquakes. There's one compressional or a thrust event, and there are some right lateral strike slip events associated with the M5.4 triggered earthquake. In the next slide, we'll see earthquake hypocenters, the depths of the earthquakes, plotted along a profile of the Gorda plate from Guo et al. 2021, basically projected along this black line profile, line B to B prime, also shown in the upper left map. So here we see the hypocenters, the M6.4 in blue and the aftershocks in blue, and then the triggered M5.4 and aftershocks are in green. Note how they mostly plot within the Gorda plate crust, the top of which is represented by that solid line. And I also include the USGS finite fault model as comparison. And there's still ongoing debate about whether or not uh, the earthquake fault slipped up into the North America plate above the Gorda plate. In this slide, I have outlined in white three possible fault main faults that were possibly involved, although there are alternate hypotheses and we're going to learn a lot more in the next year. Uh, so we can see the two main faults that are sort of northeast trending, and then I've highlighted a potential northwest trending fault for the M5.4. Uh, here I've added a map in the upper right corner that shows the seafloor magnetic anomalies in the Gorda plate. And Wilson in 2000 projects these lines beneath the North America plate. So as the, as the oceanic crust is formed, it, uh, it uh, records the magnetic field at the time that it's formed. And as the north-south magnetic polarity of the earth flips every a million years or so or less, then the crust records that mo magnetic reversal. And so these colored bands on the map represent those magnetic reversals back in time. And if we look at uh, the, the magenta magnetic anomaly projected beneath North America, we can see that the trend in seismicity aligns almost perfectly with the orientation of the magnetic anomaly. And remember that magnetic anomaly uh, is where these uh, faults that are formed at the spreading ridge are reactivated as left lateral strike slip faults. I'd also like to point out how the M5.4 mechanism is in a similar orientation, Northwest striking, when compared to the 1992 Cape Mendocino Gorda plate triggered earthquakes in the lower left corner, they all strike to the Northwest. So now we're gonna take a look at the observations. This map shows the USGS intensity model with MMI7 in the middle. We'll use this map to compare the observation sites with the intensity. The locations where field teams made boots on the ground observations are shown as blue triangles and the locations where the desktop teams identified social media evidence are shown as red circles. Here, I'll, we'll, first we'll see the map and the location of the observation is a yellow circle. So here along Fern Bridge, and then we'll see the observation. So this is the main Eel River medial gravel bar in a photo taken from the road deck on Fern Bridge as uh, you see in the orange triangle. There are two locations where we can zoom in to see some tensional cracks roughly parallel to the river, those insets on the right. And so I've outlined the tension cracks and shown uh, the direction of movement for the sediment. Uh, here we have uh, some uh, some observations along Blue Side Road west of Rio Dell. We see outboard road fill failure, and note the bend in the uh, road guardrail that rep represents that. Here along the road south of College of the Redwoods, east of South Humboldt Bay, we see evidence for north-south directed compression in the form of buckled pavement. This is common in earthquakes. 
Here along the Matoll Road, just south of Ferndale, we observed a road cut bank landslide. Here along the road north of Lolita, northwest of Fortuna, we see more road cut bank landsliding. Here in the sand dunes recreation area near Manila, we see head scarps to landslides in the sand dunes. And uh, here's another social media win. Uh, Lorna Kidd, a, re a resident of Humboldt County, posted these to uh, Friends of the Dunes Facebook page. And I contacted Lorna to get high resolution photos from her. And I used the photos and the trees in the background of these photos to uh, locate the, uh, to find the location of these. So I went out and surveyed them. Here along the river, East of Rio Del, we see head scarps to landslides and some of the deposit for the slide on the left highlighted those in orange. And here is the USGS intensity map for the M5.4 triggered earthquake because along the Avenue of the Giants west of Holmes Flat, just north of the epicenter, which is that uh, yellow circle below the yellow circle, more road cut bank landsliding. With that, I'd like to end and uh, later we can uh, field some questions and I'd be happy to share this presentation with anyone should they want it. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Jay. Our next speaker is Richard Allen, who is the director of the UC Berkeley Seismology Lab and a professor of Earth and Planetary Science. He works on real-time seismology and earthquake early warning, which is what he'll be focusing on today. Great, thanks. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk about the earthquake early warning performance um, for this particular earthquake, the Ferndale earthquake. Um, I want to thank Doug Given and then um, Angie Lux and Savas Marco here at Berkeley, Doug Given at USGS, for providing some of these slides I'm going to, to show you. So first of all, sort of background on the earthquake early warning system. It's obviously still a relatively new system. I just want to give people a little bit of background. Uh, Shake Alert um, is the name of the system um, that provides the alerts, earthquake early warning alerts in the United States. Um, it's, an, uh, it's obviously a joint effort of those involved in seismic network monitoring, the universities, Berkeley, Caltech, University of Oregon, University of Washington, the USGS, and the state agencies, Cal OES, here in California. Um, all of these groups have to work together to make this actually work. Um, and the idea behind earthquake early warning is we use the array um, of permanent seismic sensors that's deployed across the state to very rapidly detect the beginnings of an earthquake, detecting a few seconds of the P wave in order to locate the earthquake, estimate the magnitude of the earthquake, and then push a warning out um, ahead of the ground shaking. So that's, that's the concept behind early warning. Um, public alerting is uh, is issued for earthquakes where we estimate the magnitude to be greater than four and a half, um, and we issue alerts out to the region where the shaking intensity is predicted to be intensity three um, or greater. Um, and then, as implied by the people involved, um, Shake Alert now issues alerts in California, Oregon, and Washington. Um, in terms of who, how you get the alert, there's sort of two arms to this. Um, there's the public alert distribution, um, and so that's about getting it to individuals. Um, there are three primary ways that you can get these alerts. One is through the WIA system. Um, the second is the Android system, and that delivers alerts to all Android phones in the affected region. And then the third is through apps, um, and MyShake is one of those apps. There are others, Quake Alert USA, Shake Ready. I'm going to be talking about the you know, delivery to the MyShake app users as we have all kinds of data um, about delivery to the MyShake app users. The other group of users is, is the technical applications. Um, there are currently 12 licensed operators um, for the earthquake early warning signal, and these range from things like train control systems, 
um, water control, water and sewage control systems. Then there's a variety of other kind of um, uh, uh, groups that pass the alerts on for other applications, including groups like Skylight, Valcom, things like that. So there's a wide range um, of uses. It's still an area that's kind of expanding. And so anybody who's interested in making use of early warning in this kind of technical sense should, of course, reach out to uh, shake alert folks um, at one of the universities or at the USGS. Before we focus in specifically on Ferndale, um, we've had uh, several significant events in the, towards the end of last year, um, and I'm pleased to report that the early warning system did pretty well in all of these earthquakes. So these are the four events that I'm talking about. I included this slide from Doug because it gives a nice summary of the number of alerts that were being delivered. Um, the Ferndale earthquake is by far the biggest test of the system, both in terms of the magnitude of the earthquake um, and the number of people that it's delivering alerts to. So the Ferndale alert was delivered to just under 3 million Android users. It was delivered to a little less than 300,000 uh, MyShake users. But other earthquakes of significance, um, towards the end of last year, the Santa Rosa earthquake, um, the Alum Rock earthquake, and then of course the Rio Del, one of the aftershocks from the Ferndale earthquake. All of these, the system performed very well and delivered alerts um, to significant numbers of people. And that's getting people's attention. This of course is one of my favorites. This is the East Bay uh, Times. Um, it's not so much the, the headline, the Shake Alert success story. This was following the Alum Rock earthquake, but it's the fact that they label it as miraculous technology. Um, and this is sort of, you see this as well, if you look at tweets following um, these alerts, um, you see all kinds of interesting uh, responses. Um, the last one here I'm going to read out, getting an alert on your phone right before an earthquake is one of the most futuristic experiences I've ever had. So wild that it actually works. So there's a great deal of enthusiasm about this. Again, it's a new technology. We're still learning about how to maximize its impact, um, but it's getting a lot of, um, it's been very well received by the people getting the alerts. Okay, last slide before I jump into specifics of Ferndale, just to give people a sense of the system, scale of the system and its sort of success rate. Um, we've been operating and issuing public alerts now for just shy of three years, or actually just more than three years now. Um, and over that time period, there are 75 true alerts, which are the green dots um, shown on this map. There have been three false alerts. Um, all of the false alerts were actually real earthquakes but they were poorly located, okay? And so you can see two of them offshore of Mendocino. Obviously, we have very few stations. Well, we have no stations offshore. Um, and then the other one was actually an event that was on the Nevada-California border that was very poorly located. We've had eight missed events, and they are all around the edges of the network, as you can see here, and they're all small, smaller at the small end of the scale. Um, earthquakes. So we feel like we're doing pretty well. That doesn't mean we don't want to do better, but we seem we think the system's doing fairly well. So jumping into Ferndale specifically, um, Angie Lux put this slide together for us. Um, this shows the performance of the detection side of the system to detect the earthquake. Um, the first alert was issued 7.8 seconds after the origin time of the earthquake with an initial magnitude estimate of 5.6 um, and a location estimate off by 12 kilometers. Um, that magnitude rose the, the, over time. The maximum magnitude estimate was 6.6. .6. Um, and so the, to, to get a sense of what that is, you should look at the black points here. The black points are the magnitude estimate that was uh, um, comes out of the shake alert system. And you can see rose, the true magnitude is the dash line. Obviously, 6.6 .6 is just a, a, a smidge above the magnitude 6.4 earthquake. Um, the location estimate you can see very rapidly drops to a very accurate location estimate. So the reality is this is as good as we expect an early warning system to do when it comes to detecting an earthquake and estimating the magnitude. This was really great performance um, for the, the um, algorithms that were detecting the earthquake. So based on that, ShakeAlert then um, issues an alert um, uh, to out to the region where we expect to see shaking intensity three or greater. And to give you a sense of what that looks like, the map on the left is the map that MyShake uh, backend, the, the MyShake servers used to issue the alerts. And so the region that was alerted is everywhere where you see these yellow squares, uh, these yellow boxes. And so the alert region was obviously very large. This is a very significant earthquake. Um, and the alert region extends to south of the bay. You can see just shy of Santa Cruz down here. 
um, is where the alert went out to. And so again, that's this edge of the alert is based on where we expect shaking intensity three to occur for a magnitude 6.6 .6 earthquake, which was the estimated magnitude. Um, in reality, this is the shake map, obviously, on the right hand side of what the shaking looked like. Obviously, the strongest shaking closest to the epicenter. Uh, you can see that down here in the Bay Area, which of course is where most of the people who received the alert were located, you can see from the did you feel it data plotted on here, this is essentially the shaking intensity two region. And so a lot of people in the Bay Area did not feel this earthquake, but they did get a warning. And so in that sense, um, this was one of these events where we alerted um, a large number of people who then actually didn't feel it. And the reason for that is, as you can see, the contours, the shaking intensity contours, actually, um, they go up to the north here. And so the shaking in the Bay Area was actually weaker than we would expect for an earthquake of this magnitude. So that's just the reality of trying to estimate what the ground shaking is going to do in real time. Okay, so flipping over to the actual delivery, uh, MyShake is the app that delivers the alerts, one of the apps that delivers the alerts. I think it's the, the, the largest app um, in terms of the number of users delivering the alerts. It's the official earthquake early warning app of California. It's freely available in the uh, um, iTunes and in the Google Play Store um, to download and get the alert. Obviously, that's the key thing that the app does is it delivers these critical alerts in earthquakes. It will um, break through your do not disturb. But I also like to emphasize it also provides um, user provided damage maps. So um, this is a feature that we know a lot of people uh, like to use as soon as they felt an earthquake, they want to know where is the damage. And so inside the app, you can see these maps of damage. This is from the recent Alum Rock earthquake. It's all blue because there was, of course, very little damage, essentially no damage for the Alum Rock earthquake. And then it provides provides safety tips um, and information about global earthquakes as well. So what was the delivery of the alerts? What did that look like? These are some figures put together by Savas Marco here at uh, Berkeley. Um, these are the warning time plots. So on the vertical axis here is the, the time that the alert hit a phone after the S-wave arrival. So with MyShake, we built it to collect data about the alert delivery so we could verify that we're actually delivering before shaking. And so we get the receipts back from the MyShake phones as to when they actually received the alerts. And then we can calculate the S-wave arrival time. And so what I'm plotting here is the warning time, which is the difference between when the alert hit the phone um, compared to when the S-wave arrived. And all of the green points means that the alerts reached the phone before the S-wave arrival reached the phone. And so you can see down here at short epicentral distances, um, there's very few data points, there's very few receipts coming back. There's only a fraction of the phones provide these receipts, but we can see that this is about the distance where you, you had to be at this distance in order to get an alert before the shaking. And then, of course, as you get to larger epicentral distances, you have more warning time up to about 100 seconds in this, this particular case. Um, to put that on a map, um, I think this is more intuitive for people to understand. This is now showing the warning times. And again, this isn't estimated warning times. This is observed warning times. We've actually taken the receipts from the phones and, and subtracted the S-wave arrival time to come up with these warning times. And we've overlaid this on a map, a shape map of the ground shaking for this particular earthquake. So the black dashed region is the region where there was no warning available. This is where the warning arrived on the phones after the S-wave arrival. Of course, that's the region closest to the epicenter. Um, the What's shown here, this what I've labeled here is damage. This is the shaking intensity five region. Um, and you can see the five second contour here. Um, the damage region sort of extends out to sort of two thirds of the way. Um, three quarters of the way to the 20 second contour. So from this, we can see that the amount of warning time that you got or could have received in the damage zone is up to about 15 seconds. Okay, so about 50, up to 15 seconds of warning um, in the damage zone. Um, and then if you look out um, all the way to the fine, the uh, outer extent of the alerting, um, it's up to about 95 seconds of warning in the felt zone where people felt it. Um, some people felt it down here um, in the Bay Area. I wanted to just give a quick comparison um, of, uh, of the Alum Rock earthquake. 
Um, so this is the Alan Rock earthquake, magnitude 5.1 earthquake in October last year, which of course was here in the Bay Area. And um, just to give people a sense of what the warning times would be for an earthquake um, that's much closer to the an urban center like the Bay Area here. So this is the epicenter of the earthquake again, shown as the star. Um, the black circle again is the region where there was no warning. You can see downtown San Jose was pretty much on the margin of where there was no warning. Um, and then, of course, the amount of warning increases as you increase the distance. Um, San Francisco getting somewhere between 10 and 15 seconds um, worth of warning before the shaking arrived in that particular earthquake. OK, so just to kind of wrap up, um, this was the Ferndale earthquake was the largest test for the shake alert system, um, both in terms of the magnitude of the event and also in terms of the number of people that the alert was delivered to. Um, the system, I think, performed very well, um, estimating a magnitude 6.6, .6, peak magnitude of 6.6, .6, very close to the 6.4, um, with a very good location within a few kilometers. Um, about 3.3 million people were alerted by Android and MyShake combined. Um, and then in terms of the amount of warning time, it was up to about 15 seconds of warning time in the region where there was damage, and then up to 95 seconds of warning um, in the felt zone. And that's it. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you so much. Um, our next speakers are from the Office of Statewide Hospital Planning and Development of the California Department of Healthcare Access and Information. Uh, we have Chris Tokas, who's the Deputy Director and serves as the Chief Building Official for all California hospitals, and Hussein Bhatia, who is Emergency Incident Commander for the Office and Supervisor of the Coastal Region. So I think Hussein is going to present for us, but Chris is here to answer questions as well. Um, so we have been talking about hospital and SNF performance in the Fundal earthquake. Um, um, okay. Um, so the, uh, we, HKI partially activated our emergency operations center in about 900 hours on uh, on December 20th uh, due to the Ferndale earthquake. Um, so this is actually a screenshot of the map that we use in the EOC. And you can see uh, that in the region, we have a, a few hospitals and some additional skilled nursing facilities um, uh, located mostly uh, near uh, 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 the the coast there, uh, and, and then some in Fortuna. Uh, so uh, we have a cluster of hospital and skilled nursing facilities here, and a cluster here. Uh, and and also on this map, you can also see the areas uh, where we were getting a notification of power outages uh, from PG&E. Uh, so you can see on the map the areas affected. There are some additional hospitals beyond, you know, what we were looking at. Uh, Mad River Hospital being one across the bay here, and Gerald Phelps Community Hospital further away here uh, in this location. Um, so yeah, here's a list of the hospital and skilled nursing facilities. We have three. Uh, hospitals that uh, you know we were looking at initially, and then about you know five uh, skilled nursing facilities in the region. Uh, I will uh, concentrate our efforts on Saint Joseph of Eureka. Uh, so, Provi uh, Providence Saint Joseph of Eureka was posted green by our field staff. Fortunately, we had field staff located in Crescent City, which is a further north from this location. Uh, when the earthquake happened, so we quickly redirected our staff to go down to Eureka and go specifically to uh, Providence St. Joseph's, uh, which is one of the larger hospitals in the region. Uh, the only damage uh, we saw was uh, some distress in gyp board, gypsum board at, uh, at seismic separation gaps between various buildings on the hospital. I'll show you uh, that there are a number of uh, seismically separate buildings on this site, and there are seismic separation gaps between them. So the chip board around these seismic separation gaps cracked uh, a little bit. 
not not um, not to an extent that was uh, caused any problems. Uh, some more pictures of St. Joseph's Eureka, uh, just a, gen uh, a few general shots of the building, more cracks along seismic separations. There was also a, a small amount of cracking at a shear wall in one of the buildings uh, on the campus. Uh, beyond this, there was absolutely no damage in this hospital. And this is one of the sites uh, which uh, has a, a number of seismically separate buildings, one of which is instrumented. Uh, and I'm going to show you some records of, uh, of uh, the ground motion seen at the site. There is an instrument that, uh, uh, which is a free field instrument located at this hospital. Um, the map, you know, three channels recorded, the, the north-south direction, we were seeing a PGA of about 0.23 Gs. In the east-west direction, we are seeing a PGA of 0.31 uh, uh, Gs, which is, uh, you know, in comparison to the design uh, um, earthquake uh, that would be used for the site, uh, those are pretty small values or low values. Uh, uh, in comparison to the ASC 716 and ASC 722 earthquake design motions. Uh, the, as I noted that the building was uh, instrumented, one of the buildings was instrumented and that's uh, indicated in the, uh, uh, the building shown on this uh, site map. Uh, there were ch 10 channels recorded uh, in the basement level, uh, the, the, the ground motions were fairly small um, and, and they magnified as, as uh, they went up the building. But what, what I want you to see is that this building is fairly uh, irregular in the sense that it, it, it is stepped. Um, many of the floors become smaller as you go up the building and in two directions. So you see a lot of magnification that, uh, uh, at the instruments on the higher floors, but those in, you know, that magnification is totally accept, expected because of the step nature of this building. Uh, again, we didn't see any damage on the upper floors of this building. Uh, even the elevators continue to function after the earthquake. Uh, other sites, um, Redwood Memorial Hospital, uh, we had some small issues with computers and Pixis machines. These are drug dispensing machines that were offline for a little while. They were bought, brought back on, online fairly quickly. There were some uh, interior gypsum board cracks in one location. The general hospital, a few glued ceiling tiles came loose. That was the only damage that we, we, we observed. Uh, both of these were green tagged, as you can see on, in the photographs. Uh, skilled nursing facilities, um, you know, uh, uh, over all the skilled nursing facilities, very minor damage, a few ceiling tiles in, in Fortuna, uh, a water heater was damaged and replaced in, uh, in Eureka, in Granada Rehab Center. Again, the, 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 the water heater was braced. It didn't come loose. It just didn't work after the earthquake and it had to be replaced. Uh, generators and fuel. There were no generator and fuel issues. All the generators in all these facilities worked. They came back, came online 10 seconds after normal power loss as is designed. Uh, all the hospitals reported enough fuel on hand uh, while power was out and the skilled nursing facilities were relying on uh, deliveries of diesel fuel in, in some locations. But everything worked as designed. Um, I, at about 1030 hours, you see uh, the extent of the power outage had increased in, in Fortuna and areas surrounding Fortuna, uh, but the areas around Eureka, the power had already been restored by then. Uh, and then as uh, the day wore on, uh, in the evening, we saw almost all the areas power being restored. Okay, so, our conclusion here is we, we didn't have any major issues 
uh, in hospitals and skilled nursing facilities. The ground shaking at the hospitals and skilled nursing facilities was not very strong um, as measured as well as estimated. Uh, and the generators at the hospitals and skilled nursing facilities functioned as expected. And normal power was restored fairly quickly. So that's all I have. Any questions, I would be welcome. Great, thank you so much. Our next speaker is Janiel Maffe. She's the Chief Mitigation Officer and Director of Research at the California Earthquake Authority. And she's also the incoming president of ERI this year. Yeah? That works. All right, low tech always works. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Um, so we spent uh, just a, about a week in um, uh, Humboldt County uh, with the intent to look at damage, but also to look for an opportunity to bring some assistance with recovery. Uh, as Chief Mitigation Officer at the California Earthquake Authority, I now manage a grant program, Earthquake Grace and Bolt. And we've been in Humboldt County for a few years. We have about 69 houses retrofitted, no reports of damage. Unfortunately, none of those retrofits were in Rio Dell where most of the damage was. Um, so I wanna put this presentation into context of not just observing damage, but looking at opportunities for a recovery and resilience. So huge thank you to Bruce Mason, who provided photographs and observations, and to Aaron Rogers, who provided additional photos. So in context, um, before European settlement, there were culturally diverse region with a dozen distinct peoples who went and, and, and stayed in this area, uh, essentially because of the natural watershed basins. So th there's a recurring theme here um, with the European settlers eventually in terms of water and fertile soil. And I have to add timber to that because that becomes a very important part of Humboldt County. Um, so looking at a map, Ferndale out here and really, uh, this is all cattle dairy um, out here. So very fertile land, Fortuna, Rio Dell. And of course, we're gonna focus on Rio Dell. In the bend of the river here, of course, um, you can imagine uh, the types of soil there. Um, but very important to, to understand the context of the region in terms of um, not only why people live there and what the, the local industry is, but in terms of its seismicity. So thank you very much to Jason, the Triangle of Doom. I mean, when you look up earthquakes in the area, you just find one after another after another with you know these orange colors in the area and wonder why it is that all of the vulnerable houses haven't been knocked off their foundation and um, that we don't see damage anymore. And, and it's pretty clear why that is, is that there's a really vulnerable type of construction that, that exists in Humboldt County and um, will continue to, to exist for a reason that I'll explain in a minute. It's peer and post foundation um, it's supporting the house, but there really is absolutely no uh, element below the, the first floor of the house to, to really provide any seismic strength or stiffness. And this house, of course, is, is in some cases are just sitting on the dirt. And this is a, a persistent type of construction. And the reason that you don't see these improvements is that our building code allows for an exemption or exec exception to be made after an earthquake. Uh, these one and two family dwellings need not be evaluated or retrofitted for earthquake effects. So in, in effect, a house comes off its foundation, you can put it right back on that deficient foundation. Obviously, you know, the idea here is to, is to perpetuate and to encourage and to increase affordable housing. But in an area like this, where you see just earthquake after earthquake taking these houses off their foundations, um, and, and in many cases, like this earthquake, because the, um, the uh, damage didn't trigger a, a, a presidential declaration. Um, all of the and earthquake insurance, of course, is very, very uh, low take up in this area and throughout the state of California. You know, this, this, these costs are being borne by individuals, the individuals. Um, so very small population in Rio Dell, about 1,500 houses, uh, very large percentage renters, median household income. This is very important here, almost half of what it is for the state of California. And um, hit this history of the fact that Rio Dell housed workers for the Pacific Lumber Company in Scotia, which is just uh, above the, the river, is very important. Uh, there used to be a ferry. And then when the bridge came in, they actually moved a lot of the housing from Scotia into this area. So that creates a, a huge stock of older houses, vulnerable houses because of their age and um, in an area, of course, of that, that soft soil. 
So if, with thanks to Bruce for providing this, you know, it's something like almost almost a quarter of the houses had some sort of yellow or, or uh, pardon me, had not, pardon me, I'm, I'm off with my number here. 13% of the houses had some sort of damage that triggered yellow or red tag. And as I mentioned with, um, you know, no assistance coming from the outside and um, an already uh, low to moderate income within the community, this is, this is a problem. SBA is available. Very important to note that SBA is, is a loan. It is not a grant. It is not in any way um, money that comes free and clear. And you can see that for homeowners with credit available elsewhere, you know, so that could be somebody who, who already has a mortgage. You know, we're looking at a 4.6 interest rate. You know, maybe for, for those of us who, who bought purchased recently, that looks good. And then, of course, homeowners without credit available at 2.3. But once again, this is, in fact, a loan, and that loan is above and beyond their their existing mortgage. And if your house is red tagged and you've had to move out, we find these houses are not yet reoccupied about for two years. Um, of course, you're paying for um, you and your family to live uh, somewhere else. So um, another thing I wanted to point out is just the, the uh, kind of mean price of housing in the area. Mobile homes always, always um, are part of our affordable housing. And of course, we want them to be as resilient as possible. Be because of that, you can see that um, the price of, of them, of the homes in Rio Dell, uh, commensurate with what you would find throughout the state. Um, the detached houses, less than half of, of what the price is. So clearly, Rio Dell, it was a huge part of providing affordable housing for um, Humboldt County. Uh, also important to note just the age of the houses. Uh, age, it of course, can correlate to building code. Uh, if In fact, building codes were available when these houses were built. And really, 1980 is the cutoff that we use for really a lot of the seismic improvements that went into our building codes. So you can see in Rio Dell that a lot of construction in the 1939, pardon me, in the um, pre-1949 era, huge expansion, World War II, makes sense when we're building lots of houses for um, uh, that that boom that happened after the World Wars. But, you know, really these down here in the, the pre-1949 are, are really the most vulnerable buildings. And they're highly prized. When you look at the prices for these houses, you know, these are not lower priced houses. You know, they're really, they have historical value, they're, they're a character, and they're um, highly sought out by, by people. So to talk about damage and show you what we observe, I'll go through contents, chimneys, appurtenances, no surprises. Uh, these pictures were taken in Eureka. So Eureka really didn't see um, much structural damage, um, but obviously they, they saw the content damage that is that is um, very uh, uh, expected in this size of an earthquake. And when you look at things like this, you know, television that came down on the left, in fact, you know, the, the death from the Napa earthquake was from contents falling and hitting somebody. So it's important to note that these things are Important to register, important to, to continue to provide information to the general public about the dangers of content damage, not just the expected costs, but the dangers. And of course, we have solutions for anchoring them. Uh, chimneys, I call them the litmus paper of earthquakes. You know, you can kind of tell what the MMI was just, you know, when a chimney comes down. Uh, you know, the, the FEMA P1100 that we assisted in, in, in putting together talks about how they should be replaced and not repaired. Really, uh, you need to put something back up there that's that's light and it's not going to, to topple. Um, and uh, bracing them to the house is, is not a good idea either. Uh, once again, in terms of talking about injuries and in past earthquakes, in 2000 in Yountville, it was masonry surround um, that came down and, and killed a child. And in the Napa earthquake, masonry surround that came down and seriously injured a teenager. Um, so these, you know, can be very dangerous, you know, not just what they can fall on outside, but of course, what they can fall inside. And then, of course, you know, if you're not in this semi-rural area and you have adjacent neighbors like we do, certainly in the Bay Area, um, you know, a chimney coming down can, in fact, be dangerous to your neighbor. The other thing is that, you know, after the Northridge earthquake, when I saw so many chimneys down, I did a quick calc. And for many of the houses, the weight of the chimney really exceeded the weight of the roof. And so not only do they, you know, if they do stay attached, uh, at least for a while, they can actually drive damage and not just create damage. So um, really a, a, a nuisance. And as we move away from wood burning fireplaces, an opportunity to, to make a change. 
appurtenances, um, obviously porches, in this case, um, a deck came down. Very important to note that, you know, even though the house stayed on its foundation, if in fact, for some reason there was a fire, uh, when you're, you're blocking excess, exits, pardon me, egress, particularly if the occupants have mobility issues, of course, this can be a tremendous danger. So we can't look at these as being just frivolous damage or just, you know, oh, it's just an appurtenance, but rather anything that is affecting egress, of course, can be a very serious issue. Dwelling types, mobile homes, um, obviously we'll touch on that, manufactured, very common in Humboldt County, and then single and multifamily wood frame. So mobile and manufactured homes, uh, thank you to Bruce Mason. He's done a very careful study of the three parks that are up in the Rio Dell area. We saw very typical damage. They either come off entirely, or you can see by the damaged skirt here, here's the before and bottom left and the after picture, um, that it moved considerably and was red tagged by HCD. Fortunately for this homeowner and or whoever the occupants are, it did have a flexible um, gas line. Um, once again, very easy to see the damage because of the damaged skirts. Often you see separation with the stairs and other appurtenances. Um, you know, see some indication that there were it was an attempt at bracing. You know, kind of interesting here. You could call this some kind of um, I mean masonry block uh, base isolation or something. This what goes on under these mobile homes is 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 often creative, but not in any um, way effective. And um, lots of work obviously needs to be done in this arena. Um, important to note that you know some of these had in fact been shored up by the time we got there, and so some of the things that we're seeing were an attempt to get it back level so that they can get someone in here to assist them in getting off of that red tag list. Um, this was interesting, yellow tagged for, I, I assume this corner, I mean, it looks like it moved and this this is is um, is leaning. You know, a yellow tag is supposed to be to limit uh, access to an area that's, that's dangerous. So I, I would say, I, I wasn't sure, you know, I mean, this wall is either leaning and putting the vertical carrying capacity of the of the structure at risk or not. I'm, I, you know, this, I don't think this individually, these, these blocks pose a hazard. Um, but clearly you can see that this foundation and the, the structure are not properly attached to each other. Um, once again, interesting, you know, great idea. Here's a start with a manufactured house, but I don't see any mortar. And um, I don't know if this discoloration is in fact that there's grout inside, um, but these little blocks here and wood shims, um, because this piece fell off, you can see that there really was no um, appropriate attachment. So you can see bolts here. Um, but there was nothing attaching the mud sill, or pardon me, attaching to the manufactured house to the mud sill. So another red tag structure. Bruce did notice that one of the mobile home parks, the one that was constructed around 1994, in fact, the houses were braced. Um, certainly not the kind of bracing, it's not our, you know, our, our top of the line bracing, but very much worked. And so he said he saw some just some minor damage of corners working. Um, but that the, the braces worked. I mean, I, I don't like to see these braces sitting on pieces of plywood, but in this particular case, um, you know, we certainly saw that they um, were able to keep the structure at least um, from toppling. He also said he saw some of these uh, broken. And of course, these are gonna be easy to put back together again. Um, not sure whether this particular house was red tagged, but of course a red tag means uh, no occupancy. Single family dwellings, no surprises. Um, very, very common appear in post. They will put these um, uh, skirts around them, keep the critters out. Um, pier and post, very, very common, easy to put up. Um, lots and lots of vent ventilation available in this very moist climate under these houses. That's why it's so common. You can see this red tagged house clearly shows signs of moving. Um, these are clearly boards. I think this is actually T111, which is a plywood, um, but I, it does not in any way have um, appropriate nailing, and, I, and I'm, I don't believe it has the appropriate bolting underneath either. Um, lots and lots of this, where there's like a good start to have this foundation, to have you know rim joists that go all the way around, no blocking in between, and so no real load path, no way for this house to be properly connected to that foundation when the ground is moving. Here's another opportunity to see kind of unique framing, obviously, you know, stepping down the hill, Obviously, wood in contact with soil also can be a really serious maintenance issue, which then turns into a poor performer in an earthquake. 
This is a picture I took in Napa of an unretrofitted and retrofitted house virtually identical. And I, the homeowner told me they had done some retrofitting. And that's an important thing to note because here I was in Rio Dell and I talked to this homeowner and they said they had done some retrofitting. Well, this house was red tagged, identical. This house was not. So not even code compliant, but at least a step in, in, in the right direction of attaching the house to the foundation. And the difference is they did move a little bit. And I have a picture of that. Um, it, it, this one obviously came off of the foundation, significant damage. It's going to be just tens of thousands of dollars just to shore this house. The house on the right, um, I'm sorry, there it is again, that unique. But this, in this case, here's one of those concrete piers. And uh, just a tiny little post would have sat on top of that, holding up this kind of rim beam here, and um, it toppled off. Here's that house. So um, the house that has, really I'll call it um, minor to moderate damage, moved just ever so slightly on its foundation. You can see the, the kind of working that happened here. Um, very important to note that both of these houses had registered for our Earthquake Race and Bolt program. Uh, we haven't brought anybody in yet. Um, we're trying to figure out how we can use our grant fund to assist with recovery, and I'll show you how we think we can do that. Um, in this particular case, you know, this may be damage that the local building official will say, you know, you don't have to push this house back on its foundation, that the, that the amount it moved wasn't um, so severe that it will require it to be shored or pushed back into place. So let me briefly talk about how we would like our mitigation funds to be able to help this community not only just in uh, retrofit and in kind of future protection, but can we in fact help folks whose houses came off their foundation? And one of the problems is this is what we're doing with the house, we're retrofitting, we're underneath, putting in a new foundation on that pier and post, putting plywood bolts, clips. Um, but here, here's an interesting situation is that we're using FEMA hazard mitigation grant funds that you cannot use for repair. So what we're saying is, okay, so the, the pier and post house has been damaged. You're going to shore it back up, put these spindly little pier and posts underneath it, and now it's been repaired. And I always say, if you can, maybe kind of scoot them in a little bit. And then you now have this repaired house that we can come back in with our grants and give you a new foundation. Um, we're hoping that we're going to be able to make this work. We're looking very hard at being able to um, open up registration in Humboldt County again to do just this kind of thing. And um, there were, um, as I mentioned, 69 EBB retrofits, none with damage. None of them were in the Rio Dell area. We didn't see any damage in them. But there, there are, in fact, quite a few people in this area who signed up in our last registration. And we think with this heightened alertness, of course, of their risk, um, we'll get more. Uh, last Topic multifamily. This is um, these are before photos from uh, Google Maps. Oh, no, this part. These are photos that we took. Pardon me. Um, two story structures, red tagged. One story structures, yellow tagged. And when we walked up to it, this is what it looked like. And um, as a as a, a veteran of the Northridge earthquake and even the Loma Prieta earthquake, I'm thinking, huh? Um, I don't see the red tags, but I've been told these are red tagged, and I'm walking around trying to figure out why. And this was interesting because when you first walk up, you think that this is plywood and then you, you rapidly see that it is hardy board and you see that the nails have popped on the hardy board and very definitely signs of working at the corners. You can see that. You can see, you know, the hardy board actually um, uh, uh, split there. Um, you see signs of movement, very clear signs of movement. Fortunately, no, no damage to the um, gas intake. You see signs here where somebody has pulled away the hardy board that, that this is T111 underneath. So that's a, a really a really great piece of plywood that they've now come in and they've taken slices out to make three eighths inch very flimsy plywood so that it looks like boards. Um, this is obviously where they had some waterproofing issues. But now I can see the actual structural element that was that was intended to resist earthquake forces, this plywood. And we saw some some minor you know, popping of the nails on, on the plywood. You can see here, we saw, you know, some popping, um, but no significant amount of slipping. Certainly the doors, um, you could see movement at the doors. And in fact, the building official told me that he felt that the reason it was red tag is they felt that the doors were sticking and that people couldn't get out. Kind of thinking that a plane might um, solve that problem, a little weather stripping on this. This is actually into a mechanical room, so that one could sit. 
Uh, interior. So interior is really what, sh what scared everybody. When you go in, I saw what I consider to be typical working of elements that are not designed as seismic uh, resistance, but act as seismic resistance. And that, of course, are the interior partitions, very classic um, damages along the, you know, the edges, the seams of the gypsum wall board along the corners, along the corners, very classic classic uh, damage at the windows and doors on the interior. You know, this one obviously um, moved, the building moved. This is interesting. I believe that this, this diagonal existed before the earthquake and anytime you have any kind of an angle in something, you're gonna see working at that joint. Um, this is, had already been, had some mastic on it. So clearly maybe with um, uh, settlement, they've had some movement. Um, let me go back though. I did go to the building official and the mayor of Rio Dell and say that I believe that the building should not be red tagged. Um, the owner was bringing a structural engineer up um, shortly after we were there. I told them that I, you know, that if you, if you look in the ATC 20, if you look in the, the SAP program materials, there's no residual drift uh, on these buildings. Yes, they moved, but I did not believe that the dozens of people that, that were no longer able to live in their houses or even go back in their houses um, should should do that. I, I'm going to try and follow up to see if the building official um, was able to get the owner, um, the owner structural engineer is, is going to agree with that or if they're going to say that yes, it should be red tape. Um, the implications to these predominantly Section 8 residents is huge and um, particularly in this climate and then once again in this economic environment. And then finally to close with, you know, I always do this, I find some structure that just shouldn't be standing and there it is. There's our pure and post barn that probably, um, gosh, it's got to be quite old. Um, so as a structural engineer, you always say, well, you know, there are things working that, that you didn't expect to work. So with that, thank you so much uh, for listening and um, really hope to be able to assist people in Humboldt County with our program, with their recovery. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janiel. Our next speaker is Megan Stanton. She's been a seismologist with PG&E for over 20 years, and she manages the Geosciences Emergency Operation Team, uh, the 90 station seismic network, which includes the Central Coast, and geohazard related emergency preparedness planning programs and policies. Thank you for having me today. I'm going to try and figure out how to move these things out of my view. There we go. I'm here to talk about the impacts to PG&E's assets from the magnitude 6.4 Ferndale earthquake. I wanted to start my talk with how we respond to earthquakes. PG&E uses the incident command system used by local, state, and federal governments to improve coordination and a unified response. As part of the system, Geosciences has eight staff that rotate being on call every four weeks. As it happens, I was on call for the night shift the week of this event. After notification of an earthquake with potential to damage our assets, we send off a quick email to our emergency leads about expected impacts and start mobilizing our response. Our operations emergency center was activated by 325 AM. Then we gather data, including additional details about the earthquake, historical impacts, and retrieve instrument recordings. After reviewing expected damages from the quake, we made the decision to activate our EOC at 7 AM. Gas, electric, and hydro all have procedures for evaluating damage. Geosciences helps manage our post-earthquake building evaluations. Part of this process includes facility managers performing initial damage evaluations. If damage is observed, we have ATC-20 trained civil and structural engineers we can bring in to further evaluate the extent of the damage. Additionally, we participate in the building occupancy resumption programs for the cities of San Francisco and San Jose, where these engineers are also authorized to tag our buildings. Our Vacaville Emergency Response Center pictured on the right is from a pre-COVID activation. These days we have a hybrid model where our general and command staff are in the VERC and the rest of us are remote. So now, what did we find? On the electric side, we inspected 28 substations. 13 of them had an expected PGA greater than 0.25G. At the Newburgh substation, we had two transformer bushing failures. This was not unexpected as the substation was designed to an earlier standard. You can see examples of that damage in the photos on the right. Minor damage was found at Harris and Eureka A substations. We patrolled 115 miles of electric transmission lines and 190 miles of underground transmission lines. We had over 90 lines where wire slapping faults occurred. 
There were over 70,000 customers without power. By the end of the first day, we had restored 54,000 customers. Most of the remaining customers were restored the following day. On the gas side, we had over five dozen gas employees surveying by foot. We also received support from 25 additional crew members from San Diego Gas and Electric and Southern California Gas. We had multiple Picaro survey vehicles deployed and they performed 13,000 assessments. There were no customer gas outages due to earthquake damage, but the earthquake tripped earthquake valves um, on the homes of 50 customers requiring a service visit. We also responded to 200 calls from gas customers. We found 78 leaks. Most were on customer distribution lines. Only 12 of them noted earth movement where the earthquake may have been the primary cause of failure. The rest were classified with other primary causes of failure like corrosion or plastic embrittlement with the earthquake being secondary. Our corporate real estate group performed initial damage evaluations of our four, uh, four of our facilities in the area, the Eureka, Garberville, Willow Creek, and Fortuna service centers. Only non-structural damage was found at the Eureka service center, which included roll-up doors, items falling, HVAC separation, and minor cracks as pictured. All the sites had backup generators for power and those worked without fail. In other areas of the business, while the quake was felt, there was little to no damage. We performed dam and water conveyance inspections on the upper and lower Pitt River. At our Humboldt Bay Generation Station, there was minor damage to components on several engines. At the independent spent fuel storage installation, there was no damage, but a few things fell off the shelves. We had field investigations of our assets performed and there was no evidence of liquefaction or land movement impacting our assets. Lastly, our seismic instrument recordings. At the top left is the recording from our field field instrument located at the Humboldt Bay Isthmusy. Below it is the waveform from a nearby USGS station MP1581. On the top right is the recording from the CGS station CE89641. And below it is the recording from our Eureka Service Center. At the bottom is a table of the recorded PGAs and a table of estimated PGAs from our dash system, which is an internal earthquake damage estimation system. The estimated PGAs are lower than the recorded PGAs. At our ISPC, it was estimated to be 0.333G versus the recorded was 0.376G. And at Eureka Service Center, the estimated PGA was 0.237 and the recorded was 0.424. For the Eureka Service Center, one of the reasons for that might be that that instrument's actually installed in the building and the building is 15,000 square feet. Um, overall, PG&E's assets performed well during the earthquake. There was a little damage and service was restored quickly. And I'll be open for questions at the end of the presentations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. Uh, so our final presentation is going to be a joint presentation by Bob Tanaka and Richard Henninger, both of whom are senior bridge engineers in the Office of Earthquake Engineering Analysis and Research at Caltrans. Bob is a post-earthquake investigation team coordinator and Richard is the team's unmanned aircraft systems leader. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so uh, my colleague Richard Henniger and I will deliver the Ferndale Earthquake Packet Team Report. So again, this earthquake occurred about three miles offshore near the town of Ferndale. So I will talk about uh, what the post-earthquake investigation team is. Uh, uh, it's short for uh, this team is, is Packet. And then Richard will talk about the unmanned aircraft systems or UAS inspections. So, so what is the purpose of PECIT and what do we do? Uh, first of all, PECIT teams are not first responders. Uh, PECIT only deploys after we're notified by structures maintenance and investigations that the affected areas are safe for inspections and at this point, I want to give special thanks to um, Sean Hart of, of Structures Maintenance, who was in constant contact with us throughout the earthquake. Uh, Peckett, after a major earthquake event, Peckett gathers field in, information about the performance of, of damaged structures and, and bridges. And then we take this information to evaluate 
and improve Caltrans's current seismic design code and retrofit procedures. Uh, the PECIT effort is led by uh, the Office of Earthquake Engineering Analysis and Research in conjunction with Structures Maintenance. We have currently 32 engineers um, on the team supporting eight individual PECIT teams. Uh, six of these uh, four-person teams for a total of 24 are based in Sacramento, and two four-person teams for a total of eight are based in Southern California at Diamond Bar. Uh, bridge design, structures, and engineering services, geotechnical services, subdivisions are all represented among the teams. And then the materials engineering and testing services staff is also available for consultation on material related uh, issues. Uh, Pickett member duties. So uh, before an earthquake event, all of our team members will be studying the Pickett processes and procedures in the Pickett manual, as you see on the, on the right here. They attend annual Pickett meetings and training sessions. They participate in Pickett mobilization drills. And then they also ahead of time will assemble and pack their field inspection and personal gear. And then um, after a major event occurs, uh, they are deployed to the earthquake location and they inspect the bridges and highway structures near the epicenter. After that, they'll come back into the office and begin writing their investigation uh, findings and then evaluate those findings to the, the current Caltrans seismic design code and retrofit procedures. Uh, Peckett has a long history and uh, we started uh, uh, first implementing this team back in 1971 with the San Fernando earthquake magnitude 6.6. And um, the cable restrainers for retrofit were developed at, at that time, along with the column confinement uh, procedures. Then in 1989 with the Whittier Narrows earthquake of uh, magnitude 5.9, the column retrofit program was initiated. Also that year, we had the Loma Prieta earthquakes magnitude 6.9, and we improved our connection details. Um, then in uh, 1994, we had the Northridge earthquake with the magnitude 6.7, and our PECIT efforts led to um, a better procedures for uh, column stiffness balancing within frames. Uh, then we had the 2014 South Napa earthquake magnitude 6, then the 2019 Ridgecrest earthquake magnitude 7.1, and the 2021 Little Antelope Valley earthquake with a magnitude of six. Now, these last three earthquakes occurred in less populated areas, and there was minimal structural damage, which verified our current seismic design code and procedures. And uh, next, Richard will talk about the uh, Ferndale earthquake, which had a magnitude of 6.4. And I will stop sharing. Thanks, Bob. Okay, so I'm just gonna cover um, basically uh, the unmanned uh, aircraft system team or the drone team for Peckett. Uh, on, our, on our drone team, we have nine uh, part 107 licensed pilots. They have come from all disciplines and offices within uh, bridge design and uh, bridge construction. Um, we have 12 drones currently in the fleet. There's nine working drones and three training drones. Uh, each pilot is assigned one drone and each working drone camera has at least 1080p capability and most of them have 4K. We have, here's our 12, we have three of each of these uh, pictures. We have three phantoms, which are about, oh, about a foot and foot and a half in diameter. And then we've got a medium sized one that's pretty, has a pretty good camera. And then we have six small, very small um, uh, drones for um, flying in um, tight areas. So um, our first deployment on, on this particular quake, uh, we went up uh, on December 22nd, 2022, and 
we went up to the Ferndale area to inspect basically three main bridges. We wanted to uh, um, inspect the Rio Del Highway 1 Painter Street overcrossing, which is a two-span bridge. Then we also wanted to um, inspect a, a 10, uh, Highway 101 Eel River Bridge, uh, which is 16R, and then uh, the Highway 211 Eel River Bridge, um, which is uh, 134. There were um, three PECET members chosen. That was me, Daniel Chang, and Suresh Dakal. As you can see, this is a little map. Uh, actually, Eureka is north of this. Um, this is the coastline. And as you can see, as you're driving along 101, there's a small town called Rio Dale, which you've already heard about. There was a couple of bridges in there. The Painters and the 101 Rio de, uh, Eel River were in this area. And then going up a little north um, to the 211, you'll see the Ferndale, so, which is the one that was closed and actually shown in orange or yellow. So this is Painter Street uh, overcrossing. It's just a two span bridge. Um, it's got, this is the acute corner. This is the east approach. And as you can see, this is the corner of the Shear Key uh, and, and basically along the um, uh, bottom of the soffit level. And you can see that there was some spalling. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, we also had a differential uh, uh, movement um, this shows about four inches, but actually three and a half of it were pre-existing. So really the quake only caused about a half an inch. This is the east um, approach and there was some damage there. You can see there is damage that wasn't all caused by the earthquake, but there was some, um, some movement. Also the uh, middle bent to the column there, uh, didn't see uh, any damage. So I'm gonna uh, show you this film of the drone filming, we are actually looking towards the west. We're on the east approach. And as we come up, I'm just going to give you a little idea of what the drone was uh, looking for, what we we're using the drone for. And you'll see the differential in the, in the settlement between the approach and the deck, as you can see on based on what the indicate the, the railings indicate. Now, as we come off that and we go down, we see that acute corner with the um, with the uh, shear key. And as you see, there's some spalling there, um, which cut was caused by the earthquake. But however, um, if you look at the uh, reinforcement in there, that was rusting. So I assume that there was some kind of pre-existing condition and then the earthquake just exacerbated the problem and you have spalling. Um, the next bridge we wanna talk about is the 101 Eel River Bridge. Uh, this is a partial truss bridge as well as a concrete uh, um, uh, bridge. Uh, these, this is the truss, these are the steel portion, and then this is the portion which is uh, um, a concrete area. So as you look at this, you'll see that uh, we have the uh, 101 Eel River Bridge. These are some of the pictures. They have, this is the north um, approach, and you can see there has been some movement in that vertical direction, as well as a longitudinal direction. Um, we measured about two inches, and I think half of it was caused by the quake, and the other half was pre-existing. And then as you look down here, there's a seat on the north um, uh, abutment, and you can see there's movement with this white area um, indicating there was some movement. If we measured it, it turned around, turned about to be about four inches. So longitudinally speaking, there was probably about four inches of uh, longitudinal displacement. Now, when we were out at this facility and at those abutments, we got a call from Bob Tanaka, who you just heard from, and he called us and said, hey, uh, California Ge Geological Survey just called us and said that um, Pier 5 on 16R saw uh, uh, some peak accelerations of about 1.78 G. So he said, go out there and uh, take a look and see if there's any damage. So we took our drone to the uh, riverbank and took off. This is sort of in the middle of the river, and we flew over about 100 yards and then about 100 feet up, and we took a, took a look at this. This was Pier 5. This was the bearing. Um, there's, you can see at the top, there's a rocker bearing, and then there's a, a damper pad um, underneath that, and then there's a pedestal, and then there, right here in the silver box, is the uh, accelerometer that saw the 1.78 G. So we actually flew our drone into that and took a look at that particular area. It looks like there's some deflection, but not a lot of damage happened. So because of the high G loading, we wanted to take a look at one of the adjacent columns, and I'll show you that in a minute. But for right now, I just want to give you an overall view of what the bridge looks like. 
and uh, from a, an up above shot as we fly up a little bit and take a look at this. And as you can see, there's uh, the steel portion and then the concrete portion. Again, we go into this area where we wanted to look at the adjacent column just to see if there was any problems with that. Um, and I'm gonna zoom this up a little faster due to time. And you can see as we look through it, there's uh, just not a lot of uh, damage in that area. So we felt pretty good comfortable in that at that point. So uh, last but not least was the um, uh, 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 Bridge 134 on the Highway 211. This was also called the Eel River Bridge. So we actually sometimes uh, name them by their numbered numbers so that we keep them straight. This is a multi-span um, arch bridge. It was built in, I think, 1911. And it has, for its approaches, it has um, slab bridges with pile extensions. Inside each of these arches is filled with dirt, with fill, and then it's um, leveled off at the top, and then they put an as asphalt uh, wearing surface on top. So this actually does not have an, an actual deck to it. So um, uh, there's a lot of load in there. There's a lot of uh, dead load in, in, in this bridge. And since it's uh, old, it's, it's, it's seen, some, seen a few little cracks here and there. Um, on the approach, we have uh, uh, the north approach. Uh, most of the uh, damage that you see in the news where they had to shut it down was in this area. And I'm going to go uh, and, and uh, go to the next slide and kind of show you some of that. So this is the south uh, approach, south part of the approach. This is still an arch, the arch portion, and you can see the edge rail, edge beam uh, saw some compression and you saw some buckling of some of the rebar and exposed based on the spalling. You can also see a utility down there. We're gonna actually show a film in just a minute about that. And then you can see also some damage in that corner and a little bit of separation of the wing wall. And then on the opposite side, on the same south end, you also see more um, uh, wing wall separation. Uh, on the north side, this is basically why this bridge was shut down. Uh, there was some column failure um, on some of these short columns, short piers. And you can see already they had some shoring on one of these bays as well as, uh, you can't really see it, it's too kind of hard to see, but there was some shoring in there. Um, and there was some a lot of cracking in some of the bent caps as well as they had some infill walls uh, uh, pre-constructed in there um, that saw some damage to the top of the columns. So here's the, uh, the final film and we're just gonna show you that's that same edge beam that we talked about and saw the, we saw the, um, rebar buckling. I also wanted to take, show you a little bit of a glimpse uh, from above with our drone to show um, uh, basically the repair. That repair was caused by like um, one of the other speakers told us about buckling of the asphalt. This is buckling of the asphalt. Remember this is filled with dirt with fill. So there's just really no deck. So this, yeah, this was caused by a buckling of the asphalt. Now, as we come down, I'm gonna show you the opposite side where there was separation of the wing wall. And you'll see that in just a few seconds. And as we go over there, and obviously the railing was buckled due to movement, longitudinal movement. And as you can see, we go over and we're gonna take a look at that uh, wing wall also on the opposite side. And there it is. And you can see some spalling off that corner as well as the wing wall. We measured that wing wall at the top to be about two inches and at the bottom to be about uh, half an inch. So there was some separation. So in conclusion, uh, we uh, just uh, uh, really uh, a few conclusions, not all of them. We didn't show you all the damage that happened on that bridge. We just showed you highlights. Um, but the basic uh, thing is, is that shorter columns on the approach spans incurred most of the damage that was at the Fern Bridge. There was minimal movement and no damage to the isolators at the top of Pier 5 of Eel River Bridge. And, and funny thing, if we, I mention one thing, later on we found out that Pier 3 actually saw uh, 2.38G and still no damage. And uh, um, we also uh, saw some uh, the shear keys performed as expected at the Painter Street Overcrossing and at the Eel uh, River at, Del, at De Rio Del. And then also the Eel River Bridge at Rio Del also showed, showed um, longitudinal movement about four inches. 
And even though some of the locations of the bridges saw high accelerations, it did not necessarily translate into large displacements or heavy damage due to the large inertia of these, of these big bridges. They just didn't respond to, to some of this uh, high G loading. And then the final one is the use of uh, UAS or drones for bridge inspections have been verified that it's really faster, cheaper, and safer than pre uh, previous traditional methods. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. All right, well, we have a number of questions in the Q&A. Um, so if everybody wants to go ahead and bring their video back, I'll start uh, addressing these to the speakers. And if you're watching and have additional questions, you can enter them using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, so the first, I think this will be for, for Jay or for Richard Allen. Um, why do you suspect that shaking in the bay was less than you'd expect? Was this a directivity effort? effect or a velocity model discrepancy? I'm going to defer to Richard. <laughs> I was going to defer to Jay. No, so I, I, I don't think this, it's clear what the reason is. Um, it's it's very obvious and uh, that there is this, as I showed you on that shake map, the contour for the shaking intensity three region sort of swings up to the north around the, the bay. In fact, if you go back and you look at the um, forget what we called it, but the earthquake that happened exactly one year prior, um, very similar magnitude earthquake in a very similar location, you see exactly the same effect on ground motion. Um, so I would guess, my guess would be that it's a directivity effect for the Ferndale earthquake, just because it was, a, uh, you know, not east-west, but uh, the orientation of the motion on the fault was, of course, away from the Bay Area. And so that's the most likely reason I would imagine. But I think the other the other thing to comment on, right, with early warning is all we can do with early warning is we can estimate how far we expect the ground shaking to be from the epicenter of the earthquake. And so the contours, the distance to which we send the alerts is based on the magnitude um, and it's it's a circle, right? And so and so in this particular case, the, the circle to which we would alert for for shaking intensity three shaking intensity three is that many people feel it right that that includes what was actually shaking intensity two region in the bay area and so i didn't really get into this but you know so so this was an interesting event for us because in the bay area where most of the users were very few people felt the shaking because it was a shaking intensity two in the bay area but my shake sent out an alert to that region because we would expect it to be shaking intensity three so stronger um, and of course my shake breaks through your do not disturb and it will wake you up in the middle of the night and this earthquake was at about 2 a.m so it did indeed wake up people in the bay area at 2 a.m some of them felt shaking of uh, shaking but some of them didn't feel shaking and so this was sort of an interesting test um, of a situation where people are getting this alert being woken up in the night and then don't feel shaking now surprisingly some people were not pleased about that i mean that that's just the reality we have to uh, understand that if we have early warning we're always going to there's going to be some sort of uncertainty but at the same time we also had lots of positive response commenting on you know how great it was to actually get an alert even though they didn't feel the shaking. So sort of a learning experience, I think, uh, all around. I, I misunderstood the question. I uh, and So I'd like to add about the uh, intensity in the Ferndale earthquake. And yeah, we think uh, it's possibly due to directivity. And also that's why I uh, pr presented the geologic mapping to show the older sedimentary basin and the younger sedimentary basin, and that might be uh, amplifying the ground motions for that for that event also. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a couple of different questions about, I think um, that are all about uh, early warning or the MyShake app. So um, I'll go through those. Uh, the first is a question about whether or not in the future you could use the phone to get some ground motion data from the, the app users. Um, Yes, in fact, we're already doing it. So, so the actual origins of the MyShake app was as a citizen science seismology app. So when we first launched the MyShake app, the primary objective was actually to, from for us uh, at Berkeley was to actually collect waveform data, and we provided information about earthquakes, but there were no alerts at that point. So we still do that. So my shake still collects waveform data, both when the phone is stationary and it's plugged into power, it has its own detector. And so if it then moves, it has a, a neural network based approach in the phone 
that recognizes if it was an earthquake and if it was an earthquake, it records it. But also now, now that we're sending out warnings, we actually also trigger the MyShake phones to record ground motion as well. And so we actually get five minute windows of, of ground shaking from one minute before to four minutes after that trigger, whichever trigger it may be. Um, and so we're actually collecting that data specifically for the reason that the, the question question asked so that we can actually understand the ground motion that people are experiencing. And we're really just starting to look at this data, um, but it's 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 unique data because whereas most of our traditional seismic stations, they're in what we call free field sites. They're they're located in in places that are quiet. They're away from population, from buildings and things like that. Of course, the phone it's sat right where I am. So whatever ground motion this phone experiences, that's the ground motion that I experience and that my building experiences. And so I think it's a unique data set that we can use to really tell us about what people and buildings are actually experiencing in earthquakes. And so we're just getting started in terms of figuring out how we can use that data. Great. Another one uh, sort of on that uh, point is uh, someone, their question is that they reside in Arcata, but they were away in the Puget Sound area during the earthquake. So they received the alert, but obviously felt no shaking uh, <laughs> and are asking if future iterations will require the home base location to be manually adjusted when traveling. For example, if they had, if there had been an earthquake where they were while they were traveling, would they receive an alert okay. there? So let me on. explain the question first of all. For those of you who don't know what home base is, then you should download the MyShake app right now and you should use it. <laughs> Um, home base is one feature in the app where, so the, the way the app works, obviously, in order to send you an alert, we need to know your location. And so there's two ways that you can get that um, location or two ways we, we do the location information. First of all, if you turn your location services on, then your phone will update its location to MyShake's backend server periodically. And we will use the most recent location that we have to decide if we should send you alerts. So when we have an earthquake, we know we want to alert this region. And if the most recent location information from your phone says you're in that region, we'll send you an alert. Um, but what we've learned is that that doesn't always work, first of all, for phones. And also some people would prefer to turn their location services off and instead define their location. That's what home base is. So home base is when you go in and you tell it, tell the app, tell the, the MyShake system, what is the location for which you want to receive a warning? So you put your home location or your office location. Um, so, so those are your two options. Now, there's some drawbacks to that. One of the drawbacks is if you define your home location, if I define it here in Berkeley for me, and then I go on a trip to the East Coast and there's an earthquake that affects Berkeley, then I will get a warning because that's the location that I set in my phone. So that's the pros and the cons of using the home base feature versus not using the home base feature. Um, to the specific question, I don't anticipate we're going to make it more complicated, as in try and make people change their home location, lo home base location when they travel. That just becomes very complicated, as you can imagine. Um, so it's just a reality of the system. If you use home base, you will just get a warning for whenever there's an earthquake at your home base location. Great. And then there's just two questions I'll group together, which are about um, the sort of geographical extension of the of this one asking uh, if New Madrid or Utah or other zones, um, whether shake alert will be available there and then someone asking about international availability. Um, so they are speaking about earthquake in Romania where the Android receivers Android users receive that Google earthquake early warning alert and so are wondering about uh, iOS options. So you want me to speak for the USGS, for Google, and for Apple all at once, and I don't <laughs> So no, so the in terms of ShakeAlert system in the US, um, you know, I think that there is interest. ShakeAlert has been built um, based on the ANSS, the Advanced National Seismic System, the system that we use with all the regional networks in the US. So it could be expanded to other parts of the United States if it's decided that that is worthwhile and there's, you know, the necessary resources to run the system. So, so that's the, the US piece. Um, the Android, Android has an early warning system that um, currently delivers alerts in about 90 countries around the world, I believe it is. Um, which includes Romania, um, as the as the person asking the question asked about. And then the final part, when will um, Apple deliver alerts? Of course, I have absolutely no information about that. Great. And then one final question uh, about my shake and shake alert before we move on to some questions about damage. Um, and this is whether shake alert is using purely seismic array or is using or planning to use geodetic measurements as well. 
That is a great question. So the answer is, as of today, the public alerts are generated based purely on seismic data from the regional seismic networks, but we absolutely want to use geodetic data. When it comes to the really large magnitude earthquakes, um, the seismic signals, um, uh, they saturate. We, we, we start to lose sensitivity from things like peak acceleration once you get up above, I'm going to say magnitude seven, seven and a half type earthquakes. But using geodetic stations, real-time geodetic stations that tell you the actual displacement close to the fault in real time gives us more sensitivity to those truly large magnitude earthquakes, magnitude eight and nine earthquakes. And so there is an algorithm, it's called GFAST, that is currently um, under testing that I, I would expect it will become part of ShakeAlert uh, in the near future. Great, thank you. All right, so turning to some questions about building damage um, for Janiel. And uh, I think you kind of did address this one, but there's a question about utilitarian low cost supports that could be used under these post supported houses to prevent foundations from buckling. And then so with that, I'll group a question about um, how mobile manufactured homes have this issue of sliding off the foundations. Why don't we have a standard bracing system requirement for those foundations, where they're either sitting on dry stack masonry piers or steel like Yes, so there, there is a standard for mobile and manufactured homes, and um, uh, there are some structural engineers who would tell you that the standard that is adopted by California is not sufficient, um, and that it should be uh, something more than what it is. Um, I think that there's some major challenges. Once again, this is intended and, and often used as, as um, affordable housing. As well as, um, if you think about it, the, the park owns the land and the uh, owner owns the, the mobile home. And so what you really want is a, an actual foundation that's going to be, you know, going down into the, the, the park's owner's property. And, and so it, it's, it's a challenge. Um, you, have, you are required since 1994 to put some bracing in, but like any other kind of structure in California, if, if you came in before then, uh, there are not often triggers for you having to install that. Uh, once again, we're, we're, we're battling an important, a very, very important um, fact that we want to keep housing affordable. But of course, when we're looking for resilience, you know, we, we should be always marching in the, in the right direction. So that's a problem with both single family and mobile homes. Oh, and very quickly, peer and post. So um, University of Hawaii did a study, you know, they've got peer and post in Hawaii for the same reason. It's a very moist climate. And they did a study about putting in, you know, like how do these fail? Do they, you know, do they slip off the post? And they, and they did a study for just putting in little kind of, um, you know, like you would do on a deck, putting in diagonals. And I think they found that there was some improvement. Obviously, with our program, we're putting in federal funds into these houses. We, uh, you know, we'll, we'll put in a code compliant retrofit and not one of these kind of I, I, we could call it a stopgap um, measures, but you know, Hawaii looked into whether or not that was an appropriate fix for those houses. Right. There's a question. This is Janiel, but also others might be able to speak to this. Um, there were no pictures of damage to commercial buildings. Was this because there was none, or businesses weren't just the focus of these presentations? They're asking if there were retail or office buildings damage, and what about non-structural impacts as well? Yeah, you know, I should have showed a picture of downtown Rio Dell. It is, it is one street, and there are commercial buildings on either side with a few multifamily, and there was minimal damage, very definitely minimal damage to these structures. Uh, there was a commercial building in Eureka that had some damage. It looked to me to be an unreinforced masonry building. They had blocked off the street. Um, ironically, it looked as if the parapet racing worked, um, but rather the stucco came off of the parapet. Um, so unfortunately, here's this, you know, Here's this retrofit that worked, um, but the finishes fell off, and of course they're heavy. So we didn't see a lot of damage, um, it, you know. It, it, and I think that had the, had the damage been more centered in Eureka, we would have been absolutely talking about um, unreinforced masonry. I had that building in Eureka, a uh, brick had fallen onto the adjacent uh, pro property, and that building is being demolished in the coming weeks. There was an additional question specifically about the apartment building that was red tagged in Rio Dell, asking if the damage was from the, the M6.4 or the later uh, M5.4 uh, earthquake. You know, I don't know. We were able to talk to both the manager and the maintenance person, and um, they talked a little bit about 
uh, you know, I, I think that the red tagging, um, I believe it happened after the 5.4. Um, and if anybody can correct me in the Q&A or chat, I'd be happy. I believe that's what they said. Great. Um, some questions, I think, for uh, Bob and Richard about uh, transportation. So there's a question about what technique you use for column stiffness balancing within frames. Bob, you want me to answer that or? Yes, please. So we have um, we have a balancing uh, philosophy in the seismic design criteria that uh, you can look it up. I mean, I can't go into big details, but the, the, our, our, our current seismic design criteria um, talks about balancing frames and balancing stiffnesses of the of the um, columns uh, as well as other members. So he can look that up and uh, get the details if he wants to. You could probably go on our website um, or our um, Caltrans, look up Caltrans and look up seismic design criteria and you can uh, take a look at that in there. We've got a couple of questions about the Eel River Bridge and uh, bridge damage in general. So one is how much damage to the road surface of a bridge would prevent emergency vehicle access and require complete closure for repairs? And what was the reason for the full closure of the Eel River Bridge? Well, I think the the, the reason for the complete closure was those, like I said, like you saw on the north side where those um, the shoring was, because there was a couple of columns that were actually failed, but the, you know each pier, each bent has four columns. So the one on the outside failed, and I think they just had enough to where it would, the others were holding up the load until uh, reinforcements came literally. And uh, so they, they shored up that. I, I can't remember the other part of the question. What was the other part of the question? Uh, so is, if that was the reason the Eel River Bridge yeah, that was the main reason that they shut down. Um, they've, you know, they've seen um, some other, uh, uh, you know, damage here and there, but I think that was the main, main reason to shut that down. And then sort of following on that, it, there's one that says the high recorded accelerations at the deck above the isolator on Pier 3 of the Eel River Bridge might be due to the impact of decks at the expansion joint. Did you see any sign of that? Okay. Yeah, that's possible. That's very possible. Um, uh, like I said, we saw that on the other, um, one that was, I don't think that has pier three, um, saw actually higher, which was 2.17 and not sure if that I'd have to look at the geometry, but I don't think that has that same geometry. Like you say, like whoever's saying that, but I think the bottom line is it could be, it could have, it's a possibility. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there was just one more question about bridge evaluation. Are you combining drone inspection and field visits? If so, what percentage of each or how do you combine those techniques? So I can't speak for um, Office of Maintenance. We are, again, we're packet. So we only go out after a major earthquake, but um, we have implemented it into pretty much, uh, um, you can, Bob, you can back me up on this, but basically we're sending a drone pilot to each of, with the drone teams out to uh, the uh, uh, area. So if we send a team out, usually they'll have one drone pilot associated with that. Um, as far as maintenance, regular maintenance investigations, we are not part of maintenance investigations, but they have their own program too. And I'm assuming they're, they're going to be implementing, implementing drones into their uh, biennial inspections also. Great. Uh, we have a question for, for Megan um, about whether or not PG&E also uses UAS for uh, inspections of damage. We do. Um, in the particular case of the Ferndale earthquake, the fog and cloud cover prevented us from using drones for inspections in that event. Great. Um, a couple, coming back to Janiel, a couple more questions about building damage. Um, there's one that says, we saw a lot of one family dwellings with damage, but we know most of the death toll. And I'm not sure what this is referring to because I think there was actually, uh, you know, uh, that the reported deaths were later um, unattributed to the earthquake. Uh, but it says damage happened in brick multifamily buildings. So what should be done about those? I, I think maybe just, you know, in light of what we're seeing on television right now, that, that that's clearly a building type classification that is so much more dangerous. And you know, single family dwellings typical do, typically do not kill. I mean, we certainly saw whole, whole supported houses in Northridge that collapsed. 
Um, however, when you, when you see these houses, they come down two feet, four feet with the furniture flying around with the chimney blocking egress, you know, with potential for fire. You know, there is a life safety issue, but but absolutely that other category building is is more damageable. I saw very few in Rio Del, very few multifamily. There were some apartments right behind the ones that were red tag that were not red tagged. Um, we didn't go in those. So not a lot of multifamily and certainly no unreinforced masonry um, multifamily that I could see in, in Rio Del. Okay. And then there's a question saying uh, brace and bolt is aimed at reinforcing the residence itself. But considering the damage expected to masonry chimneys and the damage chimneys can do to structures, the cost to replace, et cetera, will the earthquake authority add pre-quake chimney replacement to the brace and bolt program? Yeah, so you can imagine when we started this program, the idea was where do you start? Uh, structural triage, I call it. And um, we, we did a lot of uh, polling of the community and we decided that the, the crawl space house was really where to start. Keep these houses on their foundation. They're, they're easy for uh, homeowners to understand they have this problem. You can use age as a proxy. And um, the other thing is when I looked into adding um, unreinforced masonry, I was absolutely astounded to find that it can cost as much as $5,000 to um, demolish a chimney, just demolish the chimney. And, um, you know, obviously that could be Bay Area prices, which are always huge. Uh, our retrofit statewide averages $5,000. So um, it's it's not as trivial um, an issue as as as, um, as it would seem. We're going to be adding soft story next this year. Um, so that's single family soft story houses, houses with garages under the, the house. And um, I would hope to be able to add multifamily with some funding. And I would love to be able to work on mobile homes and chimneys. All of this, of course, is funding dependent. Great. Um, we've got two more questions coming back to the topic of early warning systems. Um, one is, uh, is there any evaluation of cost versus impact of early warning system being that the epicentral area is out of the warning? I can see application areas away from the epicenter, but with conditions that make them amplify the earthquake signal. It's referring to the Mexico earth city earthquake of 1985. Yeah, I mean, obviously, that's, you know, that's one of the realities of the physics of the earthquake process, right, that the uh, strongest shaking is close to the epicenter. And that's where any available warning time is, is the is the least. Um, so that's I showed on the in my slides, I showed the, the if you remember the black dashed circle, that's the region where there was no warning. Um, and so obviously, we work very hard to minimize the size of that zone to minimize the delays in pushing out the alert. But I mean, I think there will always be um, a region closest to the epicenter that won't get a warning, unfortunately. Um, and so, so yes, yeah, so there's nothing we can get around that. But that doesn't mean that the warning can't then be useful, of course, for people that are a little bit further away. Um, and so early warning, I mean, it's not a panacea for earthquakes. That's very clear. Early, early warning is just intended to be another tool to reduce the impacts of earthquakes. Um, it's not going to be a tool that I think um, is going to help um, very much right at the epicenter. But as soon as you get outside of the epicenter, it can be useful. And as you saw, um, I showed that console with where the damage was, there still could be up to about 15 seconds worth of warning in the region that, that actually does have the damage. Mm. And there's also a question about um, connection of early warning systems to utilities for safety shutdown. So if, if you want to speak to that or if Megan wants to speak to that for pg &E. Sure. I mean, I can say something, maybe hand it over to Megan. The the, the One of the users and the, one of the slides I showed about the LTOs, um, the groups that get the warning and provide services, um, is actually a water and sewer control system um, uh, su supplier, I guess. Um, and so they've implemented the use of early warning to control pumps and things like that to reduce the impacts of earthquakes. So that's one example um, of how utilities are using early warning. And I know that um, pg &E has been doing things as well. So let me hand it over to Megan. Yeah, as we said, there's customers that do have the earthquake shutoff valves. The downside of the shutoff valves is that we do have to go back out to restore service. So we're definitely still investigating ways in which to use earthquake early warning for safety of delivering those services, but also trying to make sure that we're not adversely impacting the public in the opposite direction, either removing services from people with like medical baseline needs or things like that, where it would be more impactful if we turned off their service um, without uh, where there wasn't as a need or risk for it. Mm -hmm. um, 
We have another question sort of about utilities uh, and lifelines. Um, somebody recalls from an article that there was damage to the water system in Rio Del, uh, and we did actually plan to have a speaker on water uh, in this webinar, but they were unable to make it. So I'll just add, throw that to anybody who is aware of um, anything on damage, both to the water tank system in Rio Del, but water infrastructure in general. Sounds like we don't have anybody who's able to speak to that, I'm sorry. Um, there's a follow-up question for Janiel about the brace and bolt retrofit figure. Um, what the average cost for that is for single family dwellings? Yes, yeah, so so uh, statewide, the uh, median cost is $5,200, less expensive in Southern California than the Bay Area. The Bay Area is crazy, could be as much as twice as much. Um, we don't have a lot of houses rented, as I said, only 69 in Humboldt County. I, I But there, there's a real problem with um, getting contractors in Humboldt County. Um, they will tell you openly that their number one industry is cannabis or pot, as we used to say. And, um, uh, you, you know, a lot of those folks, though, are finding that their their jobs are, are at risk. And so we're hoping that they'll migrate into construction and bring the cost down. Uh, unfortunately, the Pier and Post House that needs a foundation is going to be more like $10,000 for a new foundation. Um, we now have a supplementary grant that goes up to $10,000, which is uniquely suited for Humboldt County, but um, yeah, on average, fifty-two hundred dollars statewide it takes two to three days. Great. So we have um, one more question about uh, this. One is for Hussein and or, and or Chris about hospital retrofit deadline. So that retrofit deadline is around the corner. Will HCAI plan on extending the deadline or moving close at moving too close at risk hospital buildings? This one, Chris. <laughs> Uh, I, sorry, I, I don't see Chris uh, on online. So um, the retrofit deadline is uh, right around the corner. We don't we don't have the authority to move the deadline. So this is the legislature. Uh, so I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> I think that's all the questions we have. Um, we have a couple more minutes left in our time for the presentation. So if anybody does want to submit one right now, go ahead and do so. Otherwise, we will go ahead and wrap this up. I'm going to share my screen with one final slide here. Just a second. Uh, so I just want to thank everybody, particularly all of our speakers, but also everybody who attended and asked questions for participating in this webinar. When you close, when the webinar closes, a survey will pop up on your screen, and you'll also receive a link for that in a follow-up email tomorrow. We'd really appreciate it if you could fill that out because it helps us make sure these uh, events meet your interests. You can learn more about ERI at our website. And then finally, I just want to say this webinar is supported with funding under a cooperative agreement from FEMA by the LFE Endowment Fund and by ERI members like you. Thank you.